Welcome back to Action Bastard Academy. I'm your host, Dean Bastard, and today we are going to be talking about Beastars Chapter 7, Game Reserve Level 100. If I had known this chapter was going to be so short, I would have just made it a double feature in the last video, Chapter 6. But then again, that video is already pushing past 30 minutes long, so I guess this is for the best. I could sure like talk forever about something if I enjoy it enough, and boy do I enjoy this series. So, we're picking up right where we left off. It was, it starts out in the uh, rehearsal room. It's uh, metaphorical, I guess. Louis in his uh, Atler outfit, and he's, you know, doing his lines and stuff with the play, uh, trying to save a gazelle, no, a zebra or something, who's supposed to be the main heroine of the play. Um, they're being assaulted by uh, elemental spirits who are have come who are coming to claim her life or something like that. Anyway, regardless, it doesn't matter. The play, the practice gets cut short. Um, the drama club president Sanu, who's the pelican, he he calls for fifteen minute break. Um, apparently, in drama club, once they start rehearsing, they don't take uh, breaks. It's kind of unusual for that to happen. Louis comments on this, and Sano pulls Louis aside, and he says he'd noticed he's known Louis for a long time, and he's noticed that Louis's moving a bit slower than usual. He's having some trouble in his movement. <laughs> Louis takes a, a Louis doesn't like this, but he goes along with the um with the break, even though he doesn't want to. He has kind of an ego, but he needs it, as we find out later. Um. Louis stresses the something to note. Louis stresses the importance of this play, um, and that it goes off without a hitch. Um, he says it's important for the school, um, and that they need to put on a good show for the new students, especially. Um, and it doesn't matter how they feel. And he <laughs> looks for validation to the um, to the carnivores who had just played the villains, and he's like, "Oh, what'd you say?" Yeah, of course. And Louis just gives them a, a glare. I felt there was some, uh, maybe double meaning in Louis's words because low key he's quite antagonistic. Ter, he's kind of a dick. Um, he Louis antagonizes everyone, but there's definitely some animosity towards carnivores in particular, <laughs> where you get to see Louis um, be a savage in general. Or find savage, but a savage nonetheless. So he gives him a glare, and I felt that uh, when he said that, was he inferring that um, it doesn't matter how they feel in regards to the play, like if they're tired or not, they're gonna give it their all. So how they feel doesn't matter as long as they don't put a good show. That's option one. Option two is the um, me looking into it way too much. Uh, thinking that Louis meant like, oh, it doesn't matter how herbivores feel <laughs> at all. So, and then when the, the carnivore just kind of just agreed with it, that's when I noticed Louis gl gave the glare. So, I don't know, I'm kind of leaning towards option two. But I don't think he, that was necessarily a intentional trap by Louis, but then again, I don't know this character too well. I get insights into it here or there, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. So, after Louis gives him that glare, Louis wants him to attack him with everything he got once they start uh, performing again. Well, rehearsing again. He wants them to come at him with everything he has as a carnivore. And Louis goes over how it's important in the reasoning for uh, herbivore, a uh, deer, um, which is what Louis is, playing the role of Atler. Um, he goes over, he says that it's important that they give him everything he has um, for them to hammer home the message of the play. What the message is yet, I have, I really don't know. I remember a little bit about what Lugosi talked about um, in regards to the play. It's basically... Uh, the Outlet play is basically about a grim reaper who falls in love with uh, someone who he's supposed to be ushering into the next life 
those two end up falling in love with each other, I guess it's implied. Um, anyway, they do fall in love with each other, but they end up going on an adventure and they learn the meaning of life and how to live again and what makes life worth living. So there's a lot of metaphorical meaning in the play. Um, but that's what it does mean. But I feel that this play means something a little bit um, different. Me, I, I, feel, I feel this play means something else to Louis. Um, because we know he has a perfectionist nature to him, right? Um, but at the same time, I'm getting... Uh, we haven't had the same insight into Louis' psyche like we've had with Legosi. And, you know, his inner his inner demons. Like, I get the feeling Louis is, is a character that's being burdened um, by something. Don't know what it is quite yet. Can't put my finger on it. But it's definitely been hinted here and there. Just how he, how he interacts with people. So I feel that's interesting. How he's very uh, determined to put on a show. Um, maybe not just for the students, even though that's what he says it's, it's for, but I feel like it's, it's for himself more than anything. That's what I got from it, at least. Who knows? I look, I look too much into everything. <laughs> so anyway, in the rehearsal break room, uh, well, it's like the backstage, I, I suppose. We have our design team. It w was, uh, uh, Legosi the Grey Wolf, who's on the design team, uh, Kai, the salty mongoose who's still upset that he didn't get uh, he didn't he wasn't allowed on the actors team uh kiwi the anteater who's legosi's friend i believe he was introduced in chapter one i believe i think jack was talking to him uh then but then again that might have been a different anteater uh fudge the red panda and then we have uh uh domu the peacock um who's also the design team director uh, uh, third year, I believe. So, while they're going uh, over, they're just working on the costume, knitting these costumes. Uh, uh, what's his name? Kibi mentions how Kai is pretty handy and quite talented working on the design team, even though he wanted to be on the actors team. So, I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> He's playing to another strength that he has. Apparently, it's not acting because of his blunders, so... Still some shade there, but at least he has a niche in, um, in design, so that's pretty nice. So, while they're there, you know, just going about their business, Legosi ends up finding uh, a piece of fabric, a piece of clothing that belonged to Tim, the alpaca, who was murdered back in Chapter 1. Um, it's funny, for everything that's going on, I keep forgetting about Tim. He's kind of like an after, he's kind of like an afterthought. Um, his murder has a lot of weight for, um, his murder has a lot of weight, but it's kind of easy to forget about it just because, just because it's not brought up too much, but when it is, it definitely has some significance to it. Like, well, like right now, um, him being murdered definitely is still a big deal, even though I'm not really feeling like it is. Maybe in the first chapter, first two chapters, but after that, not really. Um, anyway, so Legosi ends up finding his clothing, and everyone's looking at it, and they're just like, ah, oh, what should we do with it? And, uh, what's his name? Uh, Fudge, the red panda, he's just like, oh, uh, there's no reason to keep it, we should just throw it away. Legosi's like, what? And then, um, what's his name? Kai is just like, you know, Tim's dead, keeping the costume would be creepy. So, we're reminded that, you know, Tim was assaulted and murdered by a carnivore. Not just murdered, I'd say worse than murder. De well, not worse, but definitely much more terrifying than just being straight up killed. He was devoured by a carnivore, which is a big deal. It's much more it's much more, uh, much more darker. Instead of just being killed for whatever, you were, you were eaten by presumably another student. So that's terrifying. And there's still that aspect of terror, 
which I'd assume, rightfully assume that uh, the herbivores in the school are still feeling some animosity towards carnivores. I haven't really seen that demonstrated quite yet, but definitely there, it has to be there. Cause why wouldn't it be? <laughs> if you're a herbivore and you have to school, you have to go to school, sit next to carnivores who could eat you at any moment for any reason, who wouldn't be afraid then? And Lugosi even mentions that eating a herbivore in this world is the gravest sin you can commit because they're supposed to be living together. Well, he doesn't say living together, but eating a herbivore is the gravest sin you can commit in this world. My question is who decided that and why did they decide that? I can see, I can understand why. Never mind. You can't have a society that's supposed to support cohabitation between the two and not have them live together in peace. And that's why the beast star is important. I'm kind of stringing it together in my head right now. It's like, okay, duh. So it makes sense why you want to eat a, a herbivore. So, you know, there's that. So anyway, no one's talking about Tim's death. No one wants to, right? Everyone's keeping their mouth shut. They're just trying to forget it. No one wants to be, which is understand which is understandable. No one wants to be reminded of a murder that happened. No one wants to be reminded of the reality in which they, they live in. Because that's terrifying. No, you don't want to consider like one of your best friends who might just have to be a carnivore. Uh, they could just be plotting to eat you. No one wants to have that in the back of their minds. That causes anxiety, stress, and fear. So I can see why they don't talk about it. Why why sow the seeds of distrust? So anyway, Lugosi says there's a dark there's a dark ah uh, what's he okay? There's a there's an endless darkness in the world. Don't know what that means quite yet, but he says he's under he's starting to understand Louis and why he said what he said back there about the importance of him being a herbivore. Um doing the lead role against carnivores like this. I guess the play is supposed to be a message to the new students um, and supposed to give them hope. Uh, I don't know if it's herbivore centric in that sense. Um, I guess I'll have to see when they actually do the play, but if that's the case, like, you know, shoot, I'm a little confused about the theme now that, I, now that I'm thinking about it. Because obviously this play is going to mean different things to different peoples and the interpretation can be different depending on who's watching, depending on who sees the play. Obviously it's different to me because I have context uh, behind the scenes on what's going on and a little bit more insight into Louis's character. So that's why I'm thinking it might just be different. <laughs> so anyway, the reason he's playing the reason why Louis is playing this role is to make a point about the murder. And I feel that it's it's Louis's way of addressing the murder, of, of addressing the murder in his own way. Um, because even though it's not directly stated by himself, this is just Lugosi in his head and he's thinking about it. He's like, this is Louis's way of addressing the murder. As the leader of both herbivores and carnivores, it falls on him to address what happens somehow. And this is his way of doing that. So we get to the next scene. And it's Louis. He has Lugosi's monologuing. And it's Louis. And you see him. He's definitely making use of that 15 minute break. Because as we find out, he really needed it. His foot, his leg is messed up. Back in a couple chapters ago. When, when he was practicing and he saved... Uh, um, that goat from his from his fall, he ended up hurting his leg uh, pretty badly. It was a little. It wasn't just like a simple fall. It actually did some damage to him, and he and he's been rehearsing like on his on his legs, like on his feet nonstop. <laughs> he hasn't. They don't do breaks, so he's been stressing himself and pushing himself this entire time, and that's really telling. Like during that entire time, he's been in pain. And he hasn't asked for a break or anything. He's just been powering through it, giving it his all. That's telling for his character, right? 
and that's quite admirable um, because we haven't really had insight into Louis as a character quite yet but I'm thinking this the death of Tim the Alpaca might have affected him in in a way we just haven't seen yet and I and I think that's interesting and quite telling for Louis's character of him just powering through this um maybe not maybe he he did mean it like maybe he does care about the experience the other students receive from this play maybe there's some ser- there's some sincerity to his words but these are just words off the page <laughs> um and you know i always judge how these things go because from what i've seen this is a character driven this isn't a plot driven story from what i've seen it's a character driven story and then there's some seeds to that being set up in um the very first chapter and i find that interesting and i've seen it echoed in uh chapter six where i got callbacks from chapter one lugosi's introduction so if it continues this route, it's going to be very interesting to see where these characters go and what decisions they make based on not what the plot needs or wants, but what they want. And I find that fascinating. So anyway. Um, while Louis is there, he's taking his 15 minutes, uh, wincing and clutching his leg from the pain once he hears that, you know, um, it's time for the scene to begin, scene 16, he just gets up without a word, grits his teeth, lights ready, sound ready, and then he walks out proud and he's like, all right, let's begin. And I thought that was just a, that was just a well done scene. I can't wait to see that animated, honestly. Um, because they always do extra in animation, but I imagine that would be a very beautiful scene. You know, just because Louis, they're building him up to be the next B star. He's not a B star yet, from what I got. But at this point, it's pretty much already decided that he's going to be the next B star, the next leader of society. And he's really conducting himself as a leader would. Not showing, not showing weakness, standing proud, um, displaying strength, even though he is a herbivore. Um, and speaking of that, my question was, okay, if you have B, if B stars have to be accepted by everyone in the school, um, there's definitely some inherent bias because from what I theorized, they're from the rules, the small rules that, um, have been laid in society from what I got, such as like their diet and stuff. I thought that their world is, uh, is pretty much run by herbivores. That's that was my impression from it. So, if the B star has to be accepted by everyone, would in a world full of discrimination, wouldn't it be easier to accept a herbivore as a B star over a carnivore? Wouldn't it be inherently more difficult to accept a, a carnivore as a leader of society, just because just from how they are, you know, from their fangs, their claws, the desire to eat meat. Well, technically only Lugosi has that desire. No, that's not true. It has to be, it has to be, um, it's not just Lugosi-centric because the first thing we saw in the manga was just, was a murder, <laughs> uh, from a carnivore devouring another herbivore. So, I'd imagine that sentiment and that problem would echo throughout society. And this is just in a school setting. We don't know what society looks like on the outside yet and how they cope with that their instincts and their urges and stuff like that so i don't know i just found that quite interesting so louis set up to be the b star i wonder how that's gonna go especially since louis has biases towards uh carnivores as it is um Besides, outside of his interest with Lego, see, but I'm curious to see where that, where that, where that goes. Just from little hints, he's kind of racist. Low key, he's kind of, he's kind of racist. Um. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, Lego gets snapped out of his monologue again. 
deeds in his head quite a bit. But um, uh, the peacock wants flowers uh, for the pl for the ceremony. He wants to use them as decorations. He needs a bunch of roses for it, right? So he shows him the schematic of what he wants to do, and then he has uh, the ant eater. What's his name? Ant eater. Whatever, whatever. His ant eater friend go with them to the gardening club to get some uh, to get some roses to get an order of roses. Kiwi, the ant eater. That's right. And the peacock's name was Domo. I keep forgetting. So Kiwi um, goes with Legosi. Legosi and Kiwi go to the uh, the gardening club, which happens to be on a roof. I'm away from everything. Um, and while they're there, they knock on the door and Legosi, he recognizes that, he recognizes a scent that he smelled before. And he's like, wait, it's from that night. It's that scent is from that night. And he's trying to back out, right? But no, too late. The door is open. <laughs> Kibi is oblivious because nobody knows what happens that night except Legosi and Haru, of course. Um, Kibi just admires the, the smell. He thinks it's just the smell of flowers that Legosi's talking about. But no, behind the door is Haru. And we leave there on a cliffhanger. Haru's just like, you know, hey, what do you want? And, you know, Legosi's just standing there dumb and he's like, shit. And the look on his face, it's just like, shit, I'm screwed. It's the rabbit from that night. So... That's the cliffhanger that we end on. Um, the Garden of Temptation. That's that's what Legosi calls it. As a callback to uh, chapter four, when he tried to, he gave into his temptation to eat Haru. Hence, the Garden of Temptation. So that's the cliffhanger. That's the cliffhanger we left off on. To be continued. Let's see if I have it right here. The same. That pretty much wraps it up. Um, we left off on a cliffhanger. Um, I'm excited to find out what happens next. That was chapter 7. And that is the end of Beastars Volume 1. Chapters 1 through 7. I'm excited. I got the opportunity to review this series. It definitely, it's, a, it's definitely a page turner. Um, it gives, definitely gives me a lot to think about. Um, I love the world building in it. Definitely um, want to know. I have questions. I want to know more about the Beast Star. I want to know more about how their society functions. I want to see if I'm right about their society being mostly dominated by herbivores. Because from the information that they've given us just from this volume, it definitely seems like it. <laughs> um, I just want to see more about how, how, how it functions. Because... In a high school setting, um, especially like this, in most series, there's this, uh, there's a theme of, of, of growth and of change, right? Because you can't stay in high school forever. Eventually, you're going to have to grow up. So I'm wondering what the series is going to become. Um, um, yeah, I'm wondering what the series is going to turn into. Is it going to maintain the high school route? At which point is it going to change? What's it going to focus on? Because a lot of themes got introduced just from this one volume. Because my initial impression from this was it was going to be a murder mystery. <laughs> just because we opened up with the murder of Tim the alpaca. But but uh, I have a strong feeling that that's going to be on the back. It's going to be not so much forefront, but it's going to be on the back back burner that's the impression that i got from this um just because the murder of a student it gets called back to but at the same time it's just like yeah he he got eaten so maybe it gets addressed in another chapter at some point i'll just have to wait and see um right now i want to know what's going to happen uh with legosi and haru um and the implications of of Haru uh, meeting Legosi again. You know, now that I think about it, I think back, 
Haru never saw Lugosi's face, I don't think, because he was only behind her. But then again, it wouldn't be too hard to um, identify him by smell, I suppose, because Lugosi could smell Haru, like, through the door. What about Haru? So if they come into contact, maybe she can find out what will happen then. And even then, something I noticed, there was no, like, even though that event happened to Haru, she didn't, re there were no repercussions. There, like, you would think she would report it to, um, somebody, um, like, campus security, a teacher, or something. Actually, no, scratch that. It makes per it makes perfect sense why none of that has happened yet. Um, like, uh, her being attacked. Be just from what we got, uh, in chapter four, Haru wouldn't want anyone to know. She has very low self-worth, um, from what I got from reading her chapter, the Haru-centric chapter, Pretty Bad Day Even for Rabbits. It makes perfect sense why she wouldn't tell anyone what had happened. She doesn't want, she doesn't want any more attention on herself. She doesn't want to get laughed at. She has very low self-worth. Um, and she's kind of, she might be depressed a little bit as well. So it makes perfect sense. Like, even when she thought she was going to die, she wanted, um, uh, her, her assailant to eat, devour her on one bite. Just so, uh, nobody would know what happened to her. She just wanted to disappear. She didn't want to be laughed at. So it makes perfect sense, um, why that's the case, why there were no, uh, consequences or repercussions uh for the incident that happened so anyway the chap the the chapter's over and i'm still speculating i'll save that for the next volume yeah. volume two with our boy louis red deer on the cover i'm excited to cover this volume in next chapter chapter eight and i'll see you then